is a framework uh, to incorporate environmental, social and corporate governance issues into investment management. And I've been asked to just touch on the first steps for implementation. Uh, and just before I do that, for those of you who don't know much about the principles, I thought it was important that I just cover uh, in, in one slide uh, where they came from and, and uh, sort of how they, how they came about. So we were working with UNEP Finance Initiative in Geneva in 2003, which is focused mostly on banking and insurance side of things with, with uh, touching on asset management. But they hadn't engaged the superannuation or pension fund sector globally. So my task was to develop uh, some, uh, some process to, to engage uh, the asset owners in this. So we developed the principles for responsible investment and went through quite a rigorous uh, drafting process with um, the drafting group itself, which was a group of 20 of the world's largest and most respected um, pension superannuation funds. From Australia, Steve Gibbs was involved in that drafting process from um, what was uh, PSSCSS at the time. So it was launched last year by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and we had 20 signatories. Since then, uh, we've had quite a, a rapid growth in the numbers of signatories. Uh, we've now, since, since these slides were submitted a couple of weeks ago, we've had 10 more signatories, so we're up to 235 uh, and in excess of $10 trillion in assets under management. In terms of, of the philosophy behind the PRI, this is something quite different from uh, what is traditionally known as socially responsible investment or ethical investment. This is very much about uh, long-term returns and, uh, and, and making sure that we look at all of the risks and opportunities and be active owners and take those ownership uh, responsibilities seriously. So moving straight to the first steps. Now these first steps actually come from asking our signatories themselves what were the first steps that they took in implementing the principles. The first thing is, is the policy development process. Uh, a policy statement is the end result. The policy development process is really important. A lot of our signatories have told us that going through that process has been a really important first step. That process can take quite some time. Some of our signatories have taken uh, up to six months uh, deliberately working on their policy uh, development process. Obviously there's some internal expertise uh, either within your fund or if you do outsource absolutely everything uh, then that expertise would, would be with your fund managers. But there still needs to be some degree of uh, understanding so that you can ask the right questions of your fund managers. Obviously if you are a fund manager you're going to start getting a lot more questions about your capabilities and your understanding of, of these issues. From the super fund perspective uh, it's important that we start to uh, consider cap ESG capabilities in the selection of your fund managers. A another first step is to formally evaluate your current uh, fund manager compet competencies. And this is also very much a learning process. So ask your fund managers to brief you on what they're doing in this area, even back to basics, what they understand by responsible investment. What do they think uh, are the impacts of climate change, for example? Now, principle two is about active ownership. And the premise of this principle is that, especially for long-term investors and superannuation funds, you actually own a slice of, of these companies over the long term. And the companies tell us that they want investors who care about the long term so they can invest. The super funds tell us that they uh, ostensibly invest for the long term but there's some, some market failure in the middle somewhere. So what this principle commits to doing is, in some ways, going straight from the super funds through their organisations or through their fund managers to send really strong signals to companies that, you know what, we, we actually agree with that philosophy that if you need to invest long term, then you do that and we'll support you in that. Uh, there are three main ways that this principle is... Um, uh, implemented shareholder engagement, voting and filing shareholder resolutions. Uh, what we're doing as a secretariat on a global level is helping provide the infrastructure for 
of being active owners, particularly around the shareholder engagement uh, and filing resolutions. Principle three is about encouraging disclosure. Basically, it's impossible to implement principle one, which is about better analysis, uh, or principle two, which is about a sensible dialogue with companies, if you don't know what they're doing. So principle three is all about asking companies and ensuring that a bit of pressure is put on to deliver decent disclosure. And principle four is about uh, promoting the PRI in the sense of throughout the investment chain, but also internally and also in the policy arena. In terms of internally promoting responsible investment, I think a lot of larger organisations and even smaller organisations, there might be a champion or, or two champions within the organisation and a lot of people who really don't understand where this agenda is heading. So it's important that you sell responsible investment and the PRI within your organisations as well. And also the policy debate. I think it's important that investors recognise that they should engage with policy makers and regulators, not just on issues of investor regulation, uh, which there's obviously plenty of, but investors should engage with uh, policy makers on issues of company regulation. Principle five is about collaboration. A lot of activities in responsible investment are expensive. It's expensive to have dialogue with companies to initiate shareholder resolutions in the United States, for example. To help uh, signatories on a global level come together and lower the costs and increase the effectiveness of their engagement activities, we've set up this in PRI Engagement Clearinghouse, which is an online forum uh, for investors to collaborate. Uh, signatories post items uh, to the clearinghouse and in invite others to join with them. Just next month we're hiring a full-time person to support the clearinghouse. And this will be, I believe, the first time there's been a fully staffed global investor collaborative forum. But it's very early days and we'll be keen to work with um, Axie and uh, Regnans and other collaborative organisations. And we're also setting up a PRI Asia Pacific working group to help signatories in this region. And finally, reporting and transparency. I think investors uh, rightly uh, have, have demanded a great deal of uh, transparency from companies. And I think it's uh, also important that investors themselves are uh, perhaps a bit more transparent than they have been in the past. What we've done is set up an annual survey and it provides an off-the-shelf reporting framework and we'll be able to track the progress of the signatories and you'll be able to track your own progress. Um, now, the, 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 the principles for responsible investing are all about um, application of environmental, um, social and governance principles in your investment. Um, so. Now, one of the things about superannuation funds, and really I think anybody who's a fiduciary, is that you're investing to maximise returns. And I think it's arguable that under um, the sole purpose test in Australia, that that's what you've got to do. So you can incorporate ESG principles to the extent that you believe it reduces the risk in your portfolio or it enhances your returns, or it enhances your returns on a risk-weighted basis. Now, people talk about the um, legal work done by Freshfields, Buckhouse and Derringer. That doesn't change this. What they concluded was that they thought there was enough evidence around the world that ESG factors enhanced returns and or reduced risk, and therefore you could go ahead and do it. And, in fact, they said, given the evidence, you're probably obliged to apply ESG principles. But you have to satisfy yourself and believe that should somebody um, from the regulator come calling, that you can convince them that you genuinely believe you can add value. Now, in my view, um, governance clearly adds value. Uh, the evidence is stacked up, and it's clear to me that governance, is, governance adds value, and it's something that um, you should all be involved in. Environmental and social issues are rather less clear. Just on, on governance, uh, seeing the benefits, I think you can see them... I mean, it's much debated, um, but I think the, um, the, the a rational person looking at the CalPERS effect and similar effects from um, having focuses on particular companies that have bad governance 
um, is, is pretty clear. Um, and then there's the spectacular performance of government fu governance funds such as Herm Hermes and Relational. I think this quote, which was from the, from the literature by a guy called Karpov, uh, looking at, um, at all the literature on, on governance, it was, quite, it was um, very debatable in the early days. And in fact, he concluded from early studies that governance subtracted value rather than added value. But over time, people got better at it. Um, and that was, that, that was encouraging to me because I thought maybe people will get better over time. They'll learn um, on the environmental and social factors. There is some encouraging evidence about environmental and social issues. Uh, there are two, pic two papers in particular. Orlitsky's paper. Um, now, that's, uh, that's, that's an award-winning piece of research. Uh, it's also a piece of research that um, uses statistical techniques that didn't exist when I was at university and learning my statistical techniques. So I've been unable to... I can't say to you that it's a very convincing, convincing piece of work. I can only tell you the conclusions, uh, which are that social and environmental responsibility pay off. The work by Derwell is um, much more encouraging because I can read it and understand it at a first reading. Um, but it looks at um, eco-efficient... Um, investments and shows that eco-efficient investments sites um, sizably outperform less eco-efficient um, investments. Now, State Street Global Advisors has actually applied this principle um, in mandates um, where, where the, the investors wanted uh, environmental issues taken into account and have achieved significant gains in returns. One of the ways that people try to measure um, the performance of ESG issues is look at the performance of socially responsible investment managers. And on this chart, I've just got five SRI um, uh, products, and I'm comparing the performance um, in each of the last five financial years with um, the general market of Australian shares managers. In most years, there's a, an SRI manager in the top quartile and there's one in the bottom quartile. And in some years, the outlier manager, the best manager, is an SRI manager. And in some years, the worst manager is an SRI manager. So what, what, we, what it shows is that um, the performance of SRI managers is about as variable as the performance of managers that are not SRI managers. Now, that shouldn't really surprise us that much because the SRI managers um, are all different. Their processes are different. Um, their belief set's different. Um, and as if we look on this chart, it looks at the SRI managers and compares uh, their exposure to value factors, which are blue, growth factors, which are red, and to market cap, which are three significant factors in, in, in investing. And you can see that no two are alike. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, there's a, a challenger um, or ordinary non-SRI product compared with its SRI product, and you can see as the SRI product has, has struggled. Um, ING, um, and here we've got um, excellent performance by the SRI product, which is a, a top quartile product over, the, um, over most periods shown, um, but even better performance by their select product, um, with the standard um, ING um, Aussie shares product not doing quite so well. Perpetual uh, has um, a very, very large manager with a very long history, um, probably hasn't had as much attention paid to its SRI product as the numbers scream out for, uh, but the SRI product, as you can see there, has been top quartile or even the outstanding product in the SRI space. Perennial is interesting. Perennial has perennial value and perennial growth. Um, and you can see that the, um, as well as the SRI, which is again the blue square, you can see that the blue square is pretty close to the um, green triangle. Um, that's not all that surprising because the approach at Perennial is to use the growth strategy and then um, um, a apply a, an ESG overlay to the growth strategy. My conclusion is that governance adds value um, but it took some learning, and maybe we've got to do some more learning on, ES, on the environmental and social issues as well, although recent research, uh, after many years of um, results showing there wasn't, a positive, there wasn't any effect, or if there was an effect, it wasn't positive, uh, is now starting to show that, um, that it does provide some benefits. 
SRI manager performance is variable. Um, all managers' performance is variable. Uh, so you would expect SRI manager to be performance to be variable too, because style and skill can swamp the ESG issues in people's portfolios. SRI products compare well with their sister products by and large. And in my view, looking at the relative performance of SRI products and sister products, uh, and looking at the performance of governance, the value that's added by governance, um, people, investors, don't really need to fear um, going ahead and selecting some SRI investments. In this age of continuous disclosure, CEOs and CFOs are very well versed in talking financials. The beauty as I see it from actually adopting the principles for responsible investment and then de delving into issues surrounding other matters, intangibles, that include environmental, social and governance issues, is that it gives you great insight into the company. It's about asking the right questions. The CEOs are less schooled and we tend to find that we're getting more identification of their issues on staff on what their risks might be in their business. And I suppose I keep coming back to staff because I said, when I think about it, no matter if you're in a superannuation fund, whether you're in a funds management organisation, no matter if you're in any business, it is always comes back down to the quality of people and the quality of management. And I think that's the real beauty that we're seeing emerge out of adopting the principles, is that you can actually get into this social aspect or the human capital aspect of a lot of companies, and that's where you may get a true insight. This is not just ticking boxes. This is active engagement with a company, um, clearly so we can make an interpretation of where they're going. I think the UN PRI actually gives us a great framework to delve into these matters to find out what will be um, drivers for performance going forward. I do stress that it's not just equities, and, I, and my examples today are going to be equities, but uh, I think it's fair to say it, it goes across every asset class that we talk about. The one fear I have is that we've had, we're having some great discussions and we're getting movement on the gl climate change, and I think that's very appropriate. But I just want to stress that the PRI is much more than that. Uh, it's a more holistic understanding of any investment. So the first part of the program is it's got to be sold internally, it's got to be embraced, and it's got to evolve as well. I think the first thing that probably enabled me to get traction in that area was the low-hanging fruit. So the low-hanging fruit for us was to actually get people involved to understand and train the staff in, under, in, in looking at the human capital aspect. I think the other thing that we're learning is that it's well and good to pick up all the environmental, social and governance issues. The big issue is to identify the materiality of them. It's well and good to identify that there are some issues there, but uh, what is the materiality of, of it in the share price? The crux of what we've learnt in the first 12 months comes down to good news tends to creep in very slowly, but bad news is much more immediate and will gain much more publicity. As a case in point, if we pick up the environmental issues, I'm just going to t show two examples there, Origin Energy and Santos. And I'd argue Origin is well on track to becoming a very long-term, sustainable, well-run organisation with good profits coming through to investors. Gas, which is a critical power-generating fuel, particularly in the long-term transition from coal to alternatives or renewables, and this organisation has very, very substantial acreage here in Queensland particularly with their coal seam gas reserves, not to mention in the Bass and Otway ranges. And at the moment, we'd argue that's not being priced in by the marketplace. They have this retail distribution concept, and they're also working on developing uh, solar cell sliver technology. More importantly, they're practising what they're preaching, very low emissions, doing all the right things. So you don't, don't actually see that splashed across the newspapers or on 60 Minutes unlike perhaps a more obvious one, which was Santos. Last year, most people would be aware of the problems that they suffered in Java and a JV, which is continuing on as we speak. And the first question for us was, OK, understanding that there were two Indonesian companies, uh, understanding that Santos had less than 20%. OK, that's OK, it seems like it's capped. Worrying sign when you actually find that the two Indonesian companies have been sell sold to 
US shelf companies for $2. Um, but as it turns out, it, the government steps in and, uh, and does the right thing. And we look at it and we say, come back to your materiality question, about 10 per cent downside in that share price. If you had the capacity to short, potentially uh, an investment opportunity for your investors. I've just come back from the Middle East, uh, and you'd sit there and say sustainability is not sort of necessarily high on their agenda. I'd actually beg to differ. You go and see the uh, Amman in Qatar, and they've developed a 10-kilometre uh, area which is going to be their energy and technology park, and their view will be that they're worried that uh, there needs to be an alternative post-oil, and they want to actually attract the very, very best scientists from around the world into their region um, so as that they can actually create a sustainable future for their people. Four years ago, we started actually this concept of, can we come up with some tangible evidence of the quality of management, some form of assessment other than intuitive gut feel? And so we've been running a human capital survey for the last four years. Four years ago, very interestingly, National Australia Bank came up very, very poorly on their vision and values, their ethical behaviour, their information sharing. As many of you would be aware, there was a problem then in the uh, foreign trading. This year, we've rated them really, they've made a huge imp improvement in vision values, ethical behaviour, information sharing. So the negative news was very sensational. They've actually done a lot of good work. So again, a company that responded in the negative times in the press uh, and has done something about it. On the governance aspect, I realise that probably the best piece of work that I've have seen and I will endorse is Andrew Gray and his team at uh, Goldman Sachs, J.B. Weir. Their, their, their work on the governance area is exceptional. Um, every time we have updates, it's becoming more and more... There's so, so much more information coming from... and content, info, workable content for us from Andrew's work. This is the long-term excess returns since August 2001 versus the ASX 200 from his quantitative corporate governance investment strategies broken up by the six areas. And I'm not, I'm not proposing to go through this in any great detail, and I wouldn't do it justice, but I think it's just for um, instructive purposes today. The audit, remuneration and board skills numbers look very, very interesting that you've got sort of 23 to 35 per cent excess returns coming from looking at those governance scores. So from an investor's perspective, we will look at that and say that is actually quite interesting. And each time period that, it, uh, that Andrew presents to us, it's getting more and more compelling. Embrace the PRI because it, has, it is meaningful and it's not fashionable. And it's easy to sign it and be part of the program, but if I could ask you to really endorse it, live it, report on it, embrace it, share it with everybody, and collectively I think that we can make a, a, a difference going forward into the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Craig. Our final panellist today is Rob Fowler, and Rob's the Executive Manager of Investments and Gov Governance at Hester Superfund. Rob's a member of the International Corporate Governance Network, and he represents Hester on the Committee of Management of the Australian Council of Super Investors. Please welcome Rob. Um, by way of background, um, I'll just give you a little bit of history, I think, about Hester. Um, Hester's been actively voting its Australian share proxies for over a decade. Um, Hester was the first major super fund to offer an SRI option to uh, our members as part of member choice. A number of our directors and our CEO have been on various global dialogues um, in respect to governance. And my predecessor, Lisa Fazio, um, was extremely active um, in helping formulate Axie's um, initial policies when it was first being, uh, when it was first formed. So with that background, it probably shouldn't be surprising to you that it wasn't a difficult decision for the Hester directors to actually agree to support the, the UNPRI. And I've put up there the, the reasons when I mean, we do believe that as a responsible investor, you, know, you can back the PRI, and that is very consistent with your fiduciary duties of creating long-term risk-adjusted returns for members. Um, the PRI, I should point out, is aspirational. It's not formulaic, so it doesn't tell you how to do things. It tells you what you should aim to achieve. My main emphasis, though, has been on the Australian equities management. And the reason for this is it's actually the biggest chunk of our, uh, of our asset location. But also, I think the proximity makes it that little bit easier, I think, to actually engage on it and actually get change in a, in a quicker fashion. So with our Australian equities managers, what I've said to them is that I'm looking, by the end of this year, 
for them to be showing how they are transparently incorporating valuation metrics on ESG within, within their stock selection process. In addition to uh, speaking to our fund managers, um, HES has also been one of um, eight super funds, or eight investors, I should say, who have helped um, transition the BT Gas Engagement Service into a separate independent entity called Regnan, and I think you might have heard the name, name Regnan earlier. Um, we did this to help support the development of tools that can be used by fund managers, and basically we want to make it easier for fund managers to be able to incorporate environmental and social and governance issues into their process without them having to reinvent the wheel. In addition, we have been encouraging our uh, investment consultant, Frontier, to develop their own frameworks for analysing the ESG capabilities of the fund managers that we use and the fund managers they review. And I know that Frontier is continuing um, to work on the development of their framework. Uh, and I know that I've certainly had um, a few discussions with, with a number of members of their staff as they research the issue and look to formulate that. HES has been, an acti has been active in supporting additional disclosure from companies. I guess the main area really is only on climate change. Um, you've, you've heard earlier the discussions about climate change. You've heard mentioned um, the international um, the investor group on climate change. HES is a member of the IGCC. We're also a signatory to the CDP. And I think when it comes to seeking appropriate disclosure, I mentioned earlier that different funds would be taking different approaches. I think this is probably one of the areas where uh, we have taken a little bit of a different approach to, to some other signatories. Um, a number of other funds I'm, I'm aware of have been more active in seeking additional information and additional disclosure from their fund managers. Um, I think it's fair to say that eventually we will be seeking a lot more disclosure um, on environmental, social and governance issues from all of our fund managers across all of our asset classes. As I said there, I acknowledge there's a lot more work to go there. The key initiative that uh, we have undertaken in respect, I think, to, to promoting acceptance and implementation of environmental and social, govern social and governance has been on the Australian equities, which I mentioned earlier. HEST has joined uh, a group called the Enhanced Analytics Initiative. That was earlier this year. The purpose of the Enhanced Analytics um, is to boost the level of ESG inclusion in research by the stockbrokers in the view that what the stockbrokers do flows through to companies and also through to, uh, to, the fund, to the fund managers that use that research. And basically it works by incentivising the, uh, the stockbrokers by tagging brokerage to the best, um, those who are rated the best. At our, uh, I guess, initiation, and, and I definitely have to say with the support of Unisuper, we managed to convince, convince the Enhanced Analytics Initiative to have effectively what's called an Australian chapter. We're still in the process of, of getting it all, all in place, um, but I'm quite hopeful that um, the Enhanced Analytics will be releasing uh, the ratings of, I guess it'll be the top three or top four um, stockbrokers um, early next year, and on that basis we'll be able to start, uh, start tagging brokerage. Um, I have to say that you know, I have been um, one of an, a number who have been promoting this to, to other Australian funds. Uh, we certainly would love more funds to get on board because the more um, brokerage we can tag, um, the more influence it will have on the brokers. Um, and I should acknowledge that the only other um, member at this point is Fix Super, who we've heard mentioned earlier by Tony in respect to their sustainability report as well. Um, I've recently commenced discussions with a number of our Australian equities managers to get them to agree to tag some of the brokerages they're already writing. And I have to say the, uh, the feedback so far has been quite encouraging and it certainly seems to be doable. You'll note also here that there's a fair bit of doubling up, i.e. mention of Axi, Regnan, etc. and the IGCC. But nonetheless, I think um, I'm doubling up really because it really does highlight how we have to work together and all of these are collegiate groups um, who look to, to work together um, to achieve a goal. Um, so we are an active member of AXI. Um, you know, we, do, we do intend actively participating in the management of Regnan. Um, uh, James mentioned the, uh, the PRI Engagement Clearing House and he mentioned how it's a good way to, to actually be able to, uh, to generate engagement with those that, that are in power. And uh, Interestingly, I, um, um, I actually do look at the Engagement Clearing House and the most recent example I can give is, is at the moment there's an, there is a Senate investigation or well, Senate committee meeting um, in the US um, in conjunction with the SEC and they are basically taking it's a hearing in respect to whether or not they will allow um, shareholder non-binding non resolutions to be put to AGMs or not and certainly we believe that the ability of a shareholder to put a resolution on an, on an AGM um, uh, um, at an AGM um, is important as part of our stewardship 
and for that reason Hester um, has pretty much just taken the standard letter that was provided to us, mind you, but we've actually sent a letter off to the SEC um, stating our support for the status quo. Um, and I think the way this works is that you know, the more letters they get from investors globally, um, the stronger the message will be, and hopefully that will mean there's less chance of, of, of negative change in that regard. Um, I've already talked to the ICGN and to the IGCC, but again, there's more to do. I guess this is the principle where, I, frankly, um, we probably have the least to show. I've certainly been more focused on getting the ball rolling with our Australian equities managers, and I'd like to think that I have achieved something there. Um, however, um, as, part of, uh, as part of being transparent ourselves, we will be um, disclosing our active share ownership um, activities on our website, and we will be um, putting, uh, initially at least, our Australian equities proxy voting up on our, on our, um, on our website as well. Um, I have no doubt that will expand further as time goes by, but again... Um, there is a lot more to do. Um, so in summary, um, we've started down this road. I mean, as Craig, I think it was, said, you know, this is a journey and it's going to take time. Um, but you've got to actually start down that road to, to get to the end of it. Um, because of the opportunities that we see that are available, um, but the amount of work that's actually required as well, we're actually in the process of recruiting uh, an addition to our investment team. And that person will have a specific uh, focus on ESG and our PRI aspirations. Um, as you can tell, they're going to have a lot to do, but it is part of an integrated team, and I'll be working with Scott, Beth and myself to, to integrate this through the whole investment process. Um, well, that's a summary of what we've done. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you.